the graphing for you. You know, the way this can appear on a test, as I, I mentioned earlier, on some of you missed this, you may want to take a picture of this. This is the outline for test four. Um, you know, on the parametric surface problem, it'll probably be one problem where you have like a few different surfaces and you want to match them with their, with their equations. So, um, because, you know, let's, Calc 2 students don't always like to draw off the 3D stuff, so if I at least do the 3D graphs for you, I'll be able to match the parametric surface with its, with its equation. Okay. Everybody got a picture? I can go back over this later. You know, this is basically just the rough outline of what test 4 is going to look like, um, again, a week from tonight. So, oh, and in case you're wondering about this, I'm technically stopping test 4 material with surface area, what we're, what we're going to end with tonight. The topic we're going to discuss on Thursday night of this week will be a potential bonus for test four. So um, a 10-point bonus that could help, you know, a letter grade extra on your test score. Okay. All right. So attending class on Thursday might have its privileges, but if you can't make, I understand. Just, you know, watch the video. Make sure you can catch up with it. So if you can interchange the roles of X and Y, you can orient the surface in different directions. For example, this... This pairing right here, you know, x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, z equals r squared, gives me this specific parabola opening upward from the origin on the positive x axis, or the positive z axis direction, okay? Now, in most textbooks I've seen, instead of getting the parametric equations in x, y, z equals form like this, sometimes you see the parametric surface represented this way, in as, as a vector equation, which... Sounds kind of weird because you're used to vector equations being only depending on t. So, but again, if, if your t domain goes from 0 to 1, and then you have a vector equation that only depends on t, that represents a set of all the vectors that are tailed at the origin, pointing to maybe those points on the helix in space. Okay, And it generates that particular curve in space. In this case, you'd imagine a set of vectors that are tailed at the origin, and for different values of u and v, this is a set of all the vectors that are pointing to all the points on the surface in space. Okay, And so if you kind of imagine it being graphed like maybe some kind of 3D printer, if all these vectors were allowed to range through all their u and v values, they would gradually kind of make a 3D printer version of what their parabola looks like. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> some way of sort of envisioning how these, how these can be represented as, as vector curves like that, or vector surfaces like that. Um, <clears throat> but... I've just taken the parameterization from the previous page. The previous page had x equals r cosine theta. So this is just transposing r to u and theta to v. So that's still x equals r cosine theta. This is y equals r sine theta. And this is z equals r squared, or in this case, u squared, because of the same identity trick we did here. Okay? So that will still give me a paraboloid for these values of u and v. Um, well. I'll say question mark is you don't know how, how large you want the radius to go. If you want the radius of the parabola to go out to, to one or to two or to, or to root two, you can designate that for your u. And then um, v most often goes from zero to two pi. Since v is, is tucked inside your cosine and sine values, it's kind of playing the role of your, of your polar of theta. Okay? So what would be a possible parameterization for a parabola that opens along the negative x-axis? Because all the paraboloids we've graphed almost, well, ever since I've been graphing paraboloids with you, have been ones that either open up or open down, with the opening being along the positive or the negative z-axis. What if I wanted to orient it to where it opens along the negative x-axis? Okay. So x equals z squared plus y squared? X would need to equal... z squared plus y squared? Okay, you've given me the rectangular equation. Um, that's, and that's right. That's, that's yeah. not wrong. Uh, then we just substitute, right? <clears throat> if you start from that... Would it be negative x equals because x? Because you want the negative y, the negative x axis, you want to do that, yeah. x equals negative y squared plus z squared. And see, I'm using a rectangular domain here, so it's going to give me those that Batman cape effect. And let me orient it so we can actually see where the negative x axis is. z is pointing up, and there you go. X positive is coming out this way. This is positive Y. So that's the usual orientation of X, Y, Z based on textbook pictures that you've seen in, in Calc 3. And so this is a paraboloid, but it looks like, you know, like some kind of huge sail or something like that. All right. All because we're still using a rectangular definition, a rectangular domain. So how would I get 
How like you remember the disk that I had earlier in the xy plane? I used the three component equation to get a disk in the xy plane. We did the x equals u cosine v and y equals u sine v. But if I want the disk to be in the yz plane, how should I reorient that? Y equals u cosine v and z equals. Yeah, that's it. So let me, let, let me start with letting x equals 0, and then u cosine v for y and u sine v for, for z. And my, well, my u's and v's are still pretty acceptable based on that. Okay, we see a tiny little slip here. Again, because I'm using an approximated value of 2 pi, so it's not quite making it flush because I should use a few more digits there. But that at least gives us a, a full disk in the yz plane, but now if I want to turn this into a paraboloid that opens on the negative x-axis, how should I edit my x part of the equation? To get the paraboloid opening upward, we had, we had z equals u squared for the z part of the equation, but then we had those two would pair with x and y instead of with y and z. So what should I do with the x? Negative u squared. Negative u squared. Yeah, because I want x to I want it to still come from the equation that he mentioned. X equals negative u squared plus v squared, but then replace well y squared plus z squared, excuse me, and then replace y and z with their with their parametric counterparts, and you get the exact same identity. The only difference is you're starting with this equals x and this equals z, and there's a negative in front, so you still get the same identity is showing up here, and it still whittles down to x equals negative u squared to and guarantee a probability opening in the negative x-axis We would still use this trend if we were opening along the y-axis of u squared? Mm -hmm. If you wanted to open on the y-axis, you would keep y equal to u squared or negative u squared, and you put the u cosine u sine with x and z. So you can reorient them any way you want to. So to guarantee a probability opening that way, Check it out. Yeah. And it's, it's got that cool circular cross section that you're supposed to see with a parabola. Whenever you slice into it this way, you should see a circle like that as opposed to Batman's cape. Okay. But you know, they're both the same surface. It's just, you know, it's handy to be able to parameterize it that way if you had the option. So again, our answer turned out to be there's two possibilities here. And again, I'll do the lame one first. And then I'll do the cool one here. The cool one's the one that we just did. Okay? And since it is a vector equation, if you don't mind, too late I'm doing it. I'm going to use the bracket i, j, k component form as opposed to the, the letters i, j, and k. So we just figured out to get in the negative x-axis direction, we used the negative u squared on the x component, or the i component, and then we paired u cosine v with y and u sine v with with z. Does it matter who gets cosine or sine? No. I mean, you could let, you know, the, the y component be u sine v and the u cosine v go with, with z. Does it matter? That's still going to give you a circular disk in the, the yz plane. The main thing was to put the paraboloid opening part in the negative x-axis component of the equation. Okay. Um, the lame one? Well, really, it's, it's no different than this equation right here. You let y equal u and let z equal v, and then that defaults just by substitution. X equals negative, you know, v squared plus u squared or u squared plus v squared. So it's, it is a separate valid parameterization to let, you know, y equal u, z equal v, and then you have this. That would still give you the same surface. It would still give you a paraboloid opening in the negative x-axis direction. It's just, in some cases, using the cosine and sine, the polar version of a parameterization is a little bit more convenient, especially when you get to the surface area intervals, <clears throat> which we'll do here shortly. So far, so good? All right. Let's see how much of this might be sinking in. I want to parameterize... This cylinder, this is not x squared plus y squared equals 4, this is x squared plus z squared equals 4. So, since the variable y is missing from this equation, we'll see, in the xz plane, that would just be a circle of radius 2. 
But in three space, this is a cylindrical surface of radius two that's wrapped around the y-axis. So it's because the y variable is independent in the equation, it's not in there, then no matter what value of y you're dealing with, at y equals zero, there's a circle of radius two at the xz plane. If you're at y equals four, you still get a circle of radius two in the, in the xz direction. So every cross section that you do perpendicular to the y-axis will give you a circle of radius two. But I want the specific cut of the cylinder that goes from y equals negative one back here to y equals positive two up here in the front. So we just get that patch of it. <clears throat> so hmm. let's ponder what we've worked with so far. Okay, what we've done in the past If you do this, now I'm not writing on the actual notes here, I'm just sort of speculating here. If we let, um, and, and then z equal whatever, this, for specific r values, like from zero to one, that'll give me a full disk of, of radius zero to radius one. And if I let theta go from zero to two pi, um, it essentially just gives me this in the xy plane. A solid filled in disk of radius one looking like that. But see, here's the thing. I don't want to actually have an interior on this surface. If I project this onto the xz plane, how should I rearrange the, the cosine and sine definitions if I want the circle projection to go onto the xz plane? Like that. Because right, right here, cosine with x and sine with y gives you a circular disk in the xy plane. But I want the circle behavior to be on the in the x z direction. So move r sine. Okay, move r sine to from the y to the z. Okay, and then maybe that too. No. No. Okay. I'm playing dumb here, just to, just, just to sort of see if you guys can sort of ration it out. And so if I make those pairings instead, okay, so this will give me a full, completely filled-in disk in the xz plane of whatever radius I want. Do I want it completely filled in, though? No. No, I just want essentially a circular ring in the xz plane because there's no interior to this, okay? All the surface is on the outside, so... I don't necessarily want to use, well, what is the value of r that I want to use? I don't want to use r going from 0 all the way out to 2. I want to use just 2. Just two. two. So, so should you do 2 cosine theta for x and 2 cosine theta for y? Yep. And notice now I'm committing to the actual notes themselves. <coughs> so you use 2 cosine theta or v, you know, whichever one you want to use, and 2 sine v for your, for your x and your, your z equations. So this alone will give me a circle. I mean, this is technically only a oh, sugar. Let me at least use the same parameter. So I don't know the yeah, yeah. Um, So this will at least give me a curve. This, these are basically depending on one parameter. So, so far, this is not a surface. This is a curve. This is a circle of radius 2 in the xz plane. Basically, that dotted line that I got right there. Because we've left our fixed at 2, and we allow theta to probably go from 0 to 2 pi. And that would give us that full dotted circle. But how do I actually get the surface to, to go into the y direction from negative 1 to 2 to do that part? Keep in mind, to parameterize a surface, how many variables do you need? Point. You need one parameter for curves, lines, or heli helices in space. But if you need a surface in space, like this cylinder, you have to make full use of two proper parameters. So if I'm committing to, to theta being the, the circle parameter, give me the dotted circle in the xz plane, what's going to allow me to stretch this to where it goes from negative 1 to 2? So there's something plus 1 and something minus 2? No, no. Kind of Here's the beauty of it. Just let it equal r. And see, I, I'm probably confusing you by using polar. I don't want to confuse you. So. If I, if I use, you know, the variable v in lieu of theta, I mean, it's really just interchanging the variables, but, you know, you're, so you're essentially letting v play the same role as theta. That, that still 
for, from zero to two pi is gonna give me a full circle in the xz plane, that dotted circle I've got right there. So since I need a three-dimensional surface, let r or let y equal the other parameter u that we haven't even used yet. I mean it's just it's really that easy. And then what will be my inequality restrictions on u to guarantee I get that snippet of the of the cylinder? Negative one to two. Negative one to two. That's it. So in case you think I'm pulling your leg, and plus I just love the graph on this thing. Okay, y'all got that copy down? I'm about to toggle. Here I go. Toggle, toggle. Okay. So let x equal two cosine u, and z was two oh, sine u. Oh, sorry, v. I'm redefining everything now all of a sudden. Yeah, there we go. And then we let y default to being just u. So to guarantee we get that snippet of the of a cylinder itself, we went from negative one to positive two for u, and then zero to six point two eight three one eight five three. I'm going to use their full values there. And so it gives us the part of the cylinder we want. It gives us a cylinder wrapped around the y-axis, and that looks like that distance is about half that distance, so I'm going to go ahead and say 1 plus. I parameterize it that way. That has to be negative 1 on the y-axis. That has to be at the positive 2 on the y-axis. And so that gives us just that portion of the cylinder. Okay? So, so let me do this. Just that, that pairing of 2 cosine v and 2 sine v with x and z, if I left the u out of the equation, I mean, I'll, I'll leave it in there, but if I diminish its role, if I allow u to go from, let's say, negative 0.1 to positive 0.1, what's that going to look like? Uh, just like a, little a really slur. skinny ring in the x, z plane, because we're still letting v go from 0 to 2 pi. So... Yeah, that's that's what that's the, the reason I needed to let x equal two cosine v and let y equal or z equal two sine v. So I at least get the circle parameterization in the x z plane. But then to stretch it along the y axis, however far you want to, just let the y variable be the other parameter you need because you had to have two parameters for a, a surface area to be represented in space. Okay. Why is it not a solid disk? Why, Why is it not a solid disk? Because the only way you get a solid disk is to allow your u to be right here. See, if you use u cosine v with x and u sine v with z, okay? Then because... Because it is a as opposed to using a constant, if you're using a variable, you're allowing u to run through its full values. Okay, so if I let y be zero, I'm going to get a disk. Well, in this case, it'll look like a ring. I'm going to get a, a ring in the xz plane that has a radius of, well, that'll look kind of lame. Oh, so we we only allow like the two when you plug in two. That's the value you would get. Yeah. So right here, when I allow, if I want to get an actual filled-in disk as opposed to a hollow circle, I allow u to go from zero to one. So this will represent an infinite number of circles if you want to think of it. You're okay with v going from zero to two pi. That gives you the spin of theta. Okay. So if u represents every continuous value beginning at zero going out to one that this essentially parameterizes every possible circle you can get in the xz plane, beginning with a radius of one for u equal, or zero for u equals zero, going out steadily as u increases from zero to one as a continuous variable. It gives you every circle from radius zero to radius one. So that's why it's a filled in solid disk. Whereas if you pair the number two with cosine and sine, it gives you a fixed radius of two without every circle in the middle or from zero outward. And since we wanted a cylinder, we just wanted that fixed circle of radius 2, and we used our parameter v to give us this, the circular part. And then we used the parameter u to just sort of stretch the circle into the y direction. Yes, sir? What if one has a u and the other one's a constant? What if, so in other words, if you have only one variable, yeah. if you're only using... Two cosine and a u sine. Oh. So that'd be a wavy. So see, now you're, like, you're, you're looking to just sort of play with the song. <laughs> Um, well, it gives me an elliptic effect, but and it's in, let's see, it's still in the xz plane, so it just gives you that elliptic effect. So you have, you still have every radius from 0 to 1 for the u variable z, and then x is fixed as 2 cosine, but 
that gives you at least a circular effect. Is it a wavy disc? Pardon? Is it like a wavy disc or something? Well, no, I think it's still flat because it has to be. The, the y component is still zero, so this only exists in the xz plane. So it's it's not wavy. If you want to make it wavy, you can put something here that, that produces wavy behavior. Let's say, I'm guessing here. <laughs> <laughs> question marks. What are you doing, Charleston? <laughs> oh shoot! They went to the next equation. Okay, not there, not there. Come on, I want you right there. There we go. Well, let's just make it U squared. Oh, that's Whoa. kind of wavy. It looks like a boat. Yeah. <laughs> wow, a boat. All right. Or you turn it upside down. It's a ship's hat. Maybe you've done much already. Okay. So, I mean, I mean, playing around with this has really come just because you can, you can just make all sorts of loopy, crazy services like that. You start with what's familiar. You start with the praboloids and the little, you know, discs or the cones and stuff like that. And then you say, well, what happens if I do this, you know? Um, one of the other funky kind of services you can do is if you interchange the roles of U and V, if you still keep V being like a theta and you let, let's see, make sure I do it correctly. See. No, that's not it. Do over. Okay. If you know, if, if I let z be a function of v as opposed to being a function of u, it produces. Uh, let's see. Let me shrink it down a little bit. It gives you this. Well, this corkscrew kind of effect. And since V represents your theta, if you go to, to multiple revolutions, like, um, again, what would 8 pi be? I did it a second ago. 25.13. Oh. Whoa. Let me fix the resolution a little bit. So let's, Can we let's, use the end thing key. on that? Pardon? Can we use the end thing on our Z? Oh, hey. To make it. And that would actually make it sort of expand if you do N times V. And if we allow N to go from... 0 to 1 in 10 increments, which will let me do that. Oh, this is kind of cool. What's this going to do? Yeah, gives you a slinky. <laughs> <laughs> so it still gives you that corkscrew, but then you sort of, you know, making it bounce back and forth. All right. This is, I believe this is called a helisoid. It's like a helix, but it's all—it's kind of like the the design of a of a corkscrew or like a you know Archimedes screw or something like that, where Archimedes or like screw. a you know just regular old, you know drill. All right. And all because you're using V with the Z instead of U with the Z. Okay. All sorts of funky little surfaces you can do, you know, just playing with that. Any of you have a MacBook, you can grab these on your MacBook. There's a, a program called Grapher that comes pre-installed on every Mac that I've ever had. So it, it just double check the syntax to make sure you type it in in the right way. It could be taken kind of like this, but um, it'll use the parameters U and V and just sort of play around with it, um, just to see what you can what you can do with it. So last example before we get into talking about surface area, what would the parameterization of the portion of a sphere lying inside the cone? z equals root x squared plus y squared. So I want the, the portion of a sphere that's a sphere of the origin radius 2. So just a cross section of what this looks like. Here's my sphere just as a cross section. Here's the origin in the middle. So let's just say that this is the xy plane and this is the z axis opening up. Okay. And again, sphere of radius 2 in all directions. I want the, the portion of the sphere that's lying inside this cone. Remember what's handy about that cone? What does that cone look like in space? Where you from? Its yeah. apex is at the origin, so it's kind of an inverted cone because it opens up like this as opposed to you thinking like a regular cone. So it opens upward like that. And it makes a very handy 45 degree angle with the Z axis. So when you overlap the cone with the sphere, it kind of intersects looking like this. So really, what we want is we want just this part of the sphere that lies on the sphere but inside the cone itself. So maybe some kind of, well, for lack of a better word, it's kind of like a yarmulke. I mean, it's just that little cap of a sphere, you know. So how would we just set up parametric equations that x equals y equals z equals equation set that would give us just that patch? 
And keep in mind, we need to pair this with some inequalities for our parameters so that way we're isolating just that part. But it's solid, right? Um, it, it's just a surface. So it only is a, it's only a two-dimensional surface. So in other words, when you're using a two-dimensional domain like U and V, we're taking some snippet from this, this sort of imagined UV domain and we're using our parametric equations like, like these to sort of morph its shape. In this case, we want this to turn into a circle that fits right there on the top of the sphere, kind of like a yarmulke. So it's, it's solid as much that it's a surface in 3D, but it really only has two sides. It has a top, has a bottom, has no interior. You see, it's not a solid object, but it, it exists in 3D because it's just a, it's essentially just a surface. Okay. So it's really, it's only geometric attribute you could measure you can't measure volume with it, but you can measure surface area with it. Because it's really only a two-dimensional quantity that came from a two-dimensional domain that's been rearranged or mapped. So, so we use polar coordinates to give us circular objects. Is there another coordinate system that might come in handy here? Was that the, the superpolar? Uh, superpolar, yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> spherical, yeah. yeah. Um, let me remind you, let me collectively remind all of you of the of the spherical conversions. And uh, wait, there was a marker with Todd. Took it over here. Okay. So think spherically. And these spherical equations translate really well to the x, y, z parametric equations that we want. Remember, spherical coordinates use rho for rho. the radius of the sphere. Yes, I got it right before you use, um, use theta, the same theta in spherical is the same theta from cylindrical and polar. It represents the, the lateral spin in the x, y plane about the z axis. Phi, remember phi's restriction. Phi is the angle that, that pitches off the z axis. And it only exists from zero to pi. Phi equals zero is the north pole. Phi equals pi over two is the equator in all directions. Phi equals pi over two. And then phi equals pi is the south pole. Okay. So the, the x, y, z conversion equations are rho, hold on a second, rho, rho sine phi cosine theta is x represented in terms of rho, phi, and theta. These are given on the test. If you need these, these will be given to you. I never made I won't make you commit to memory. But if you witness the derivation that night, kind of, you know, that, that's, that's what I just did, because I never committed these to memory, but I remember rho projects down here with sine phi and here with cosine phi, so that's the main thing. So rho sine phi projects rho to the xy plane as a, a polar r, and then r sine theta gives you y. And then to project rho to the z-axis, that's all you have. You don't actually have theta involved in Z's spherical conversion. So I want this patch of a sphere. So the sphere's radius two. Who here would play the role? And, and keep in mind, we're parameterizing a surface. So one of these guys has to go away, some way, shape, or form. Is that the radius? The pardon? Z radius? Well, no. Z is, is, is your Z direction. We're looking to, to translate this into the information about this spherical surface. So see? Rho cos phi. Rho is going to represent what value here? Two. 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 Rho will be constant because the sphere's radius represents your spherical rho value. We're not going from rho equals zero all the way out to rho equals two. We are stuck only on that patch of a sphere of radius two. So rho is held constant. So if you're thinking rho sine phi cosine theta for the x equation, the actual translation here, and again, I'm, <laughs> I'll draw a little thought cloud above x because that's what he's thinking about. Huh. He's like, I know that's my spherical conversion, but you know, for this particular surface, my rho's gonna be two. So rho's fixed at two, but then phi and theta. Am I, is my surface, fixed in the phi direction, or do I have actual values that span from phi equals zero to phi equals something else? Phi is not fixed. Phi, phi starts here at zero, and I'll come out to phi equals 45 degrees. So you just figured out the inequality limits we need to impose on phi. And the only reason we're going to 45 degrees is because why? Because of the cone. The only use of the cone here is to, to limit your phi, because phi will be cut at 45 degrees. So I still want to leave phi in the mix. And you can use the variable phi or you can use the variable theta. Since we're likening this to 
to spherical, I'll go ahead and stick with phi and theta used there. Because phi, again, this is his domain coming off the z-axis from the north pole at phi equals zero to the pitch of that cone, which is 45 degrees. Theta's domain is going around this way. Okay, so that blue stuff is theta. The green right there is phi. So to guarantee I have the right phi values, I'll say zero is less than or equal to phi, less than or equal to pi over four. And that's all because of the cone. And then theta spins laterally around. So our, our yarmulke is not just a quarter yarmulke like this. It's all the way around yarmulke. So that means I want theta to go from 0 to 2 pi. And I'm not making fun of yarmulkes. I'm just, you know, that's just the first thing I think of when I think of that, that particular picture. It, it looks like a yarmulke. <clears throat> and so rho is fixed here because you're on a sphere of radius 2. And rho's purpose in spherical coordinates is to represent the radius of a sphere. So that's why we use those equations, but the only thing that you need to change is put, replace rho with a 2 in each one of them. 2, co, two sine phi cosine theta zero. here. 2, would, pardon? Would it be 0 to the power of 4? Yes. For I phi? I thought it was. Wait, let me double check with you. What yeah, is 0 is because it goes over 4 or 3 power? Yeah, because remember, phi, phi is like the, the pitch off the North Pole, it's like the tilt of your joystick. Your joystick's always default position is North Pole. And if I want to go to the edge of that cone, I have to tilt phi from zero to pi over four. But notice, oh, okay. phi, phi goes kind of omnidirectionally off the North Pole, yes. like lines of um, latitude. I was thinking it started at the bottom. Okay. Oh, no, phi, okay. phi equals zero is, yeah, it's not here. Yeah. So, so it's, yeah, you're actually going from here. Phi equals zero is the North Pole, and you want to go, and you want to stay inside the cone. So if you go from 0 to pi over 4 in all directions, mm -hmm. omnidirectionally, then that means 0 to pi over 4 here, pi over 4 there, pi over 4. So in all directions, uh -huh. 0 to pi over 4 for, for phi gives you something inside that cone. Yeah. Okay. What if we wanted the first octant portion of this yamaka? What would that change? There you go. Just theta. That's it. The equations stay exactly the same because it still gives you that same mapping, but you just let theta go from 0 to pi over 2. <coughs> Bless you. What if we wanted the portion of the sphere of radius 2 lying entirely below the cone? Just make phi, uh, phi negative? No, no phi only exists. Yeah, yeah. So, so it would be pi over 5 to pi over 4 to. Pi over four to Power two. Yeah. Close. You're you're still above the xy plane. If you want the entire part of the sphere that's below the cone, you want to pi pi begin at pi over four and then stop at pi. 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 So you just change this from pi over four to pi, and it will give you all the surface of the sphere below there. Okay. And that's go small to large. Yeah. Incre yeah. And and that was what was messing up your orientation. Zero is always north pole, so pi over two, pi over four is forty five degrees yeah. off the z axis. So you want to go from pi over four, passing through pi over two all the way to pi, to the negative z axis. Yeah. Because remember, phi goes omnidirectionally in all directions off the z axis. Zero at the north, pi at the south. Okay. Kind of makes sense. So so essentially, parameterization can kind of boil down to sometimes using the the polar or even the cylindrical coordinate system, like we did up to this example. And in rare cases, maybe pulling out spherical coordinates to help you represent, you know, patches of spheres that are restricted by other surfaces. Okay. And and then the cool thing, the thing is, you can't represent that red surface right there with one equation. If you're restricted just to x, y, z coordinates, you have to type in x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals four, and then you have to type this in, and just you know, see the sphere and the cone.